This past Saturday, I and a bunch of folks went to a prayer meeting up on a mountain somewhere in our city. About 100 of us were praying, people from many nations. And here's just one snapshot of it. Uh, here are former Muslims. They were Muslims who are now followers of Jesus Christ. Come on. They are following <laughs> Jesus Christ. And around the Muslim world, uh, there are literally millions of Muslims in Africa, in Asia, who are coming to the Lord. They're having dreams. They're having visions. And so the battle is raging uh, between the God of the universe and other forces of other entities. But this was a great encouragement to me. Another great encouragement was the next slide. And uh, a couple of those folks that are on this next slide were in this room two weeks ago. Uh, we have uh, Messianic Rabbi Joshua Rubenstein, who is in in this room. They're obviously the tall man in the back. Uh, he's Jewish. Uh, to his left, uh, to our left, is uh, Pastor Kadisha, who's an Iranian Persian pastor in the region. She was here also two weeks ago. You may have seen her on the video if you were here. And then uh, in that little huddle there, on the right is a Palestinian woman who was a Mormon, uh, not a Mormon, a Muslim, uh, who is now a Christian. And so here we have a Jew, an Iranian, and a Palestinian hugging. You probably see that a lot on the news. You see that all over the place. No, without Jesus, that's impossible. Okay, so don't expect people who don't know Jesus, who are Muslims, uh, who are Palestinians or Iranians and Jews to be hugging a lot. They're not having a hug fest. This is like this, you know, but it's not a lot of hugging going on. But this is a miracle of what God is doing in our age, even in our city, America's most racially diverse city. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we talked about, and I felt it was a prophetic word, that this year was going to be a quantum leap year. Uh, something that was going to go beyond the norm, the average. And uh, you may not be there at this point, but the good news is there's still a few more months to catch up, okay? To believe, I believe, for what is genuinely happening in our city. And so I find myself in many places going into rooms and trying to lift those rooms, lift understanding, but I'm finding more and more that there are people divinely prepared for the conversations I'm trying to bring to them. Um, in... in um, in this, this room two weeks ago, we had a service called Healing Racial Wounds, okay? And at that point, we had a couple of police chiefs here, Sacramento Police Chief, the Roseville Police Chief, and they sent me beautiful notes. Here is the Sacramento Police Chief, Sam Summers, talking about that service. He said this, services like that give me inspiration and hope that our efforts and relationship with the faith-based community throughout the region is paying huge dividends. I think we are truly making our community the example on bringing people together and finally breaking down barriers that have been in place way too long. Next slide, it continues. I know we have a strong and committed team and I am confident that our future in this region is gonna be great. Maybe someday someone will be doing what you did at that service in discussing Sacramento's rich, diverse history and telling the story of how all of our efforts and relationships became a model for our nation. Now you can give God a hand for that. So everyone say model for our nation. We are called to be a breakthrough city. At some point, you've got to identify who you are. Who are you? Who are you? We are called to be a breakthrough city. We are called to be a breakthrough region. Why? Because there's a desperate need for us to be that. You heard a couple weeks ago, uh, Dr. Joy Johnson, who was here, and she was sharing how on a phone call, a webinar across the country a few weeks before, after Ferguson, Missouri, uh, after uh, things were still unsettled, uh, that she was talking to 75 leaders around the co country uh, that were connected to the Fuller Theological Seminary, a, a Bible study called a Micah group uh, that was dealing with racial issues. And she said, I was the only voice out of 75 cities in our nation that was speaking positively of what God was doing relationally among leaders in the region. And she said, though it blessed my heart that we had something to share that was positive and good, it broke my heart that there were so few voices, no voices on the phone, except voices of hopelessness and despair and discouragement and sadness. And so, once again, who are you? Who are we in this hour? Who are we in this hour? I believe we are called to be a breakout region, which is going to necessitate you being a breakout person, okay? You and I breaking out uh, 
from the breaches, from the broken relationships that may be in our own lives. Uh, and so I'll be talking uh, probably most of the time, both on the micro of our individual relationships, individual needs, individual issues, and then the macro, those things that extend across the region. Because in reality, the body of Christ is bigger than this little body here or, or even just the body in uh, this city or this region. It's throughout the nation. We are connected throughout the world more and more. Another uh, email that came in from the police chief of Roseville, uh, Daniel Hahn, he said this about that service two weeks ago. Thank you very much for inviting me and even more for having such a service. It is always refreshing to see leaders who encourage people to value and appreciate everyone and more importantly, people who feel it is imperative that we do so. I have to say there were many things that really stick with me from the great service that night, but one was definitely the quote from Martin Luther King Jr. you put on the screen. I think that quote says it all. You have to be an extremist about the things that are important. In my professional life, that means good people to work for the police department that truly value and appreciate, and these are, this is his capitalization, our entire community. I can ramble on forever, but thank you very much for inviting me the other night. I am better for being present at that service and for that and much, much more. I added a much. And much, much more, I thank you. Give God a hand for that. That's a great quote as well. So here we have leaders in the region that when they come around the Christian community, they are filled with hope and anticipation to be who they are, to step out and believe for something extraordinary to take place in their community. And they do see the church as being vitally part of that. I was at a town hall meeting right after Ferguson, a little t time after with the mayor of Sacramento and, and other leaders. And over and over again, those leaders who spoke, uh, particularly from the secular community, used the word clergy, clergy, the clergy. They probably said it, I'm, I'm serious, 30 or 40 times referring to the need for the church. You know, we have opportunities to gather people every week. Uh, very few groups do that. We have a, a word of God that talks about us uh, being ministers of reconciliation and reconciling all people to God, uh, breaking down walls and barriers and bringing that harmony. And now we find ourselves, I'm not gonna go back in it, but if you've not seen the video and did not attend that weekend, go online to the Rock app or rockofroseville.com and look at the service two weeks ago, Healing Racial Wounds, worth looking at, amazing videos there, amazing time, and that's what they were talking about. But uh, it speaks to the fact that we, uh, in this region with a history where our original pastors stood up, that's why we're doing that video on uh, the his spiritual history of Sacramento, our pastors stood up for racial reconciliation, and they stood in the gap to keep California from becoming a slave state. And so we have that legacy. We have been given that. Now it's in our court, in America's most racially diverse city, to also uh, be heralding that reality. I was at a, a wedding a few weeks ago doing a wedding and uh, it was an old friend. Uh, we'd known them for 40 years. Their daughter was getting married so I was doing the wedding. And so at the reception, a bunch of us who had known each other for decades were there sharing and one of my friends who's a lawyer received the Lord around the same time. He made a comment that I thought was so clear that I wrote it down and here it is on the screen. We are still discovering the depth of our problem while God continues to reveal the magnificence of his solution. Now, let me encourage you with this. Uh, if you would say that you, you are still discovering the depth of your problem, and yet you are simultaneously discovering the magnificence of God's solution, that is called the Christian life. That is called, all of us should be experiencing this. If you're not experiencing this, maybe you're just experiencing, I, I got all my problems, but you're not experiencing the magnificence of the solution, then God wants you to see the reality of both. Um, to me, they are both important. Uh, I, I need to know, again, when he said the initial portion, we all kind of nodded, yeah, my issues are still ever before me. But his solution is also ever before me, and I'm embracing that. So I thought that that's a, a great filter to keep us not just repenting at some different point in our past, but 
changing now. I, I'm here to change. I want to change now more than I ever have. I want to become the man God has called me to be. You, the woman God has called you to be. And so that, I believe, will keep us then fresh, our relationship with God fresh. Look at this verse here, uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Uh, Jesus said, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 just persons who need no repentance. Think of it in these terms. There's more joy in heaven over one person willing to change than 99 people who are just saying, I don't need to change, I've changed enough, you know, it's all over for me, I'm freeze-dried and, and frozen in time in some past experience, running on the fumes of yesterday rather than passionate about the relationship that God wants to have with me today. So when I read that, I'm not just thinking about the person who comes to know the Lord, which is a part of that. I'm thinking about me as a Christian. Am I the guy who's willing to still change? Or am I just this, you know, frozen chosen, this little pharisaical religious person up on a stage going through the motions, lip syncing, you know, by Milli Vanilli Christianity, Milli Vanilli Christianity, and I'm not a passionate pursuer of Jesus. I want to be the person that brings joy in heaven. And so while I'm alive, that's what I'm pursuing. Um, I'm saying all this, once again, to remind us it's not going to be just about you. If you get stuck, everyone around you that you love will be stuck as well. I remember playing Capture the Flag. Ever play Capture the Flag as a kid? I really did love that game. It divided into two different teams, the red and the blue in our case. Uh, and uh, what would happen if someone tagged you, you went to a little prison. Um, and then uh, someone would have to break through the lines without being tagged and then touch you in the prison and then everyone in the prison would get out. And I remember uh, being in prison uh, and maybe there's 25 of us in prison and there's only about four or five people left on our side. We only have a little remnant that could possibly break through. And then you'd see, you know, one of our guys just, you know, barreling over, you know, jumping over trees and, and finally, you know, touches us and then all of us are free. The exhilaration of that freedom, of that liberty, that's what it's going to take, folks. That's what it's going to take us believing that we are called to set captives free. That's why the anointing of God is on us. That's why we're breathing right now. Now you say, well, I'm discouraged. Who here is not discouraged? Would you stand up? We want to beat you up right now. Anybody here? I mean, everyone, that's the normal. Every one of us are going to be swatting the mosquitoes of discouragement. They're not going to define me. I reject the lies of the enemy. I am fighting that battle that God has called me to fight. In this world, you will take you to the bank, have tribulation, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'm with the one who's overcome the world. Yeah. How do you overcome the world? Even our faith, believing the promises of God. So I want to be the person that is changing all the days of my life. My message is healing breaches brings revival. Healing breaches brings revival. Revival. Now, what breach? Well, it could be the breach between you and God. That brings a revival. You get revived in your life. The breach in your marriage, the breach with your neighbor, the breach with your parents, your kids, your brothers, your sisters. There's all kinds of breaches that are taking place. Seeing those breaches healed brings a move of God in your life and in the lives of those around you. Uh, take out your phone. Uh, my phone, unfortunately, is in the car right now, resting. But uh, take out your phone. We're going to vote right now. Do you have a relational breach with someone? Um, and um, you should have the Rock app. Hopefully by now, there's like 1,300 people have the Rock app. Uh, uh, yes, uh, a few. If you don't have the Rock app, go to Messages, um, and then type a new message, and then um, do 22333, and then type in rock iq1 so yes a few people yes one person i used to have a breach but our relationship has been healed and lastly i have no relational breaches and we'll begin to tally those responses right now so we have a horse race between one and two and now others begin to tap in so it is a um it's a real deal the essence of this is that breaches are in play in the vast majority of our lives. I would have pressed four up until a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm trying to resolve one breach uh, that I'm in pursuit of, having meetings this week for that. So I pressed two last night there. The point I'm making is breaches are real, being in pursuit of them is real, and it's important uh, that we get them healed. 
uh, relational breaches uh, uh, he, uh, kill revivals in the same way relational healing brings revival. In the Welsh Revival of 1904, uh, there was a move of God of love and acceptance, but when division came, it pulled the rug out from it, and gradually it began to dissipate, in particular the person who was the tip of the arrow. Azusa Street the same way. Azusa Street, 1906, uh, was a racially diverse uh, group of people coming together uh, in 1906. Uh, but by 1914, uh, the, the remnant of Azusa Street had made a, um, a, a, a law that they would not allow anyone in leadership who was not a person of color. So it had come the full gamut from hurts, from being rejected themselves, then that division uh, continued. I want to show you a video. We went to Wales a, a couple, three years ago, and um, it was an amazing adventure filming in the places where the Welsh revival took place and studying it and then considering how did it happen and what caused it to dissipate. And I believe, uh, as I thought about it this week, wow, everything I heard on that video when I played it again this week after uh, not seeing it for a couple of years, I, I really feel it's apropos for this moment. So here it is. If there were one quality about God, that he would want each of us to know and value, it would be love. Love was actually the principal theme of the Welsh Revival of 1904. Not surprising. God not only radiates love, he is love. It's his essence. Therefore, loving relationships have premier importance to him. First, in the restoration of his relationship with us, and then in our relationship with one another eventually we will see it is impossible to have a healthier relationship with others than we have with God. When we know God's heart, His love overflows to everyone around us. Healing relationships is actually the very reason Jesus died and why He lives to restore what has been lost, why He longs to heal what has been hurt, and why He died to liberate all that is bound. Relationships are the centerpiece of the greatest battles that have taken place in heaven and now come to earth. They are the ground zero of spiritual warfare. Their face is human, natural, but their roots are supernatural. The devil attacks who God is, love. Broken relationships are therefore the breeding ground for division, and division is the biggest kingdom killer. Jesus said, any house divided cannot stand, as heaven was torn apart by a breach in the angelic host. Adam and Eve's sin has likewise spread the epidemic throughout the earth. It is these relational breaches that break God's heart and keep us from fulfilling the prayer of Jesus. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. As all moves of God require great unity of spirit, every assault of the enemy seeks to separate and even alienate us from one another. One of the first controversies related to the Welsh Revival was that God used young women, particularly in music and testimony. Many were not ready for women to have such a strategic role. Also, within a few months of the start of the revival, a successful minister named Peter Price began to criticize Evan Roberts for the emotion the revival meetings seemed to at times generate. While many believe there was a measure of truth in Price's comments, they likewise agreed he seemed to have been jealous as well. These critiques were so disconcerting to Evan Roberts that he soon withdrew from attending public meetings altogether. Physically and emotionally, he was completely exhausted. Breaking down, he went into obscurity and would only resurface for a short period of time some 20 years later. To what extent this relational breach affected his spiritual and emotional well-being 
God only knows. But it appears the vision tore at the very fabric of this revival. Less than a year after Evan Roberts withdrew from public ministry in Wales, the Azusa Street outpouring in Los Angeles began. As God chose a former coal miner with no formal education to spearhead the Welsh revival of 1904, he likewise chose the son of a former slave, William Seymour, to light the spark for the Azusa Street revival in Los Angeles, California in 1906. The Azusa meetings began with a great diversity of African American, Hispanics, and whites in attendance. This occurred even though Seymour's mentor, Charles Parham, mistakenly believed in segregating the races. In time, the issue of racial separation would become a divisive issue between Seymour and Parham. Yet in spite of their disagreement, the revival spread around the world. 600 million Christ followers now trace their roots to what has been called the Pentecostal outpouring. Both the Welsh and Azusa revivals overcame the hurdles of gender and race, but were not limited by the economic and educational backgrounds of their leaders, proving once again that God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the things which are strong. What if relational divisions are the primary reason God is unable to move powerfully in our lives, the church, and in the culture? Could our indifference to heal every breakdown in relationships, every breach between races and people groups, and every division between genuine followers of Jesus be the very thing that's keeping him from coming in transforming power? You know, I really do believe that that reality, that the harmony of heaven, the harmony within the Godhead, the desire of God for family, to love, to care. God's a father. Is there any father or mother in this room that doesn't want your kids to love each other well? I will tell you, uh, when my daughters love each other well, it blesses our hearts. When they're having difficulty, it, it raises significant concerns for us. And so there's a father who feels that more than we do. Um, I do love the, the quote from C.S. Lewis. When we think about uh, the changes that we need to go through on earth, this quote encourages me. It's from The Great Divorce, a great book. Uh, a ghost in this metaphor is arguing, arguing with a bright spirit and says this. Uh, this is the, the um, ghost that is complaining. Oh, of course, I'm wrong. Everything I say is wrong, according to you. Then the spirit says, but of course, shining with love and mirth so that my eyes were dazzled. That's what we all find when we reach this country. We've all been wrong. That's the great joke. There's no need to go on pretending one was right. After that, we begin to live. So here's the thing. I want to stop pretending that maybe I'm more right than I thought. No, I'm probably more wrong than I think. And so once I acknowledge that, I'm not trying to prop me up. I'm trying to say, Lord, whatever you see in me that's not right, shine the light on that, and I will then acknowledge that before you. And then we can move on. He's not wanting to rub your nose in what you've done wrong. He already rubbed his son's nose in what you've done wrong. He wants you then to walk in the victory of that forgiveness and that miracle, really, of relational reconnection. And that's the reality of it. I believe that the miracle of relationship Relational reconnection is, is the breeding ground for a move of God. Think about, well, Jesus was on the earth. The disciples were still thinking that they would get a great place uh, around him in heaven. And uh, then he dies. Suddenly, they are jolted. Uh, they didn't expect it. They thought he was going to bring his kingdom to earth. But he, he kept saying, my kingdom is not of this world, okay? And so now they're discouraged. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen. Then he's resurrected. And all of a sudden, they're feeling really bad because they should have believed. They should have believed. Uh, once again, I think about eternity. I don't want to wake up in eternity and, and, and hear some of the things I'm saying to you right now. That Francis, you could have been an active player in what I was doing on the earth. Not that God's ever going to talk to us like that. I'm just trying to say, I don't want to wake up and go, I missed the great event. I wanted to make history. I was in Sacramento, which was poised to make history. I wanted to see my nation changed, and I spaced out 
thinking about my needs and my issues and my problems and just spent my life whining rather than drinking the new wine of God's spirit. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. But anyway, I don't want to think about standing before God and having missed the opportunity. I want to be awake now so that I don't feel bad later. So the disciples, he's resurrected. Uh, then they see him and they're so elated. And then they uh, spend 10 rooms in a, 10 days in an upper room uh, worshiping and praying, and I believe this is important, genuinely looking into each other's eyes and asking forgiveness and saying, I will never not be there for you. I will never want to be more important than you. I will esteem you as more important than myself. I believe they got it right. And then when the Spirit of God fell and they saw the opportunity to go out and represent Jesus well this time, that Peter goes, I'm not going out without you guys. I am not going out there alone. We are a team. And so they went out together, and Peter stood with the 11, and suddenly the church was united. And that's when the Spirit of God fell. Acts chapter 2, look what it says here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, one heart, one mind, like heaven, like the Godhead. They are in one heart, and God's Spirit fell. That's what I'm believing for in Sacramento. I'm believing for it in the macro here in the region and also the micro in your relationship with yourself and those around you. Um, God reminded me of a definition that God gave me about 30 years ago. Wrote a book called Spirit uh, Led Evangelism in 1986. We published it. Spent a couple years fasting and dissecting every verse in the Gospels, every verse in the book of Acts, and came up with this definition of revival. Here it is. At times when Christians are united in prayer, God will sovereignly and suddenly move in power. He will there, therefore provide a platform for anointed ministers to preach the gospel to a prepared audience in order for their hearts to be convicted and turned to him. Uh, this week I kept uh, hearing him say, prepared audience, prepared audience. There are people prepared for what you're going to share. Let me ask you, uh, when, how many of you are born again? You received Jesus, you're born again. How many know that your heart, when you finally accepted him, had been prepared, that you were a prepared audience, okay? When you finally prayed, okay? A number of you, not everyone would raise their hand, but I know, when I woke up the morning having slept on the river in Nevada City, uh, hitchhiking my way through uh, Northern California, going to see a, a friend's mother on Mother's Day, I never thought that night I would walk into a country church and get saved. But God had prepared my heart to receive him. And I, I would say that we are seeing around the region people's hearts being prepared. This week, uh, another leader and I went to visit a, a leader uh, that we had never visited together, a leader of thousands in the region, and uh, we began to share our hearts. He was very gracious, but, but we were in pursuit of him. We were asking uh, him to, in a sense, join us in what was going on. Uh, we showed him a video of what was going on in the region, and, and I would just say this in the most positive way, he was completely compliant. He was, compl he was like, he was like uh, low-hanging fruit, if you will. His heart had been divinely prepared for this conversation. And then at one point he said, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and I still think about it because it was such, I want to just kiss him at that moment. It was just such a good moment that we weren't striving to make something happen. And I, I tell you, I, I had gone through lots of changes about that meeting, praying, asking intercessors to pray, pray for this meeting. It's going to be an important meeting for the region. And he was ready to receive. I believe that's what God has for us. You know, when Paul, uh, the apostle, was beaten in jail in Philippi, back shredded, and said, you know, perfect time to worship God. At midnight, they began to sing praises. All of a sudden, the jail is rocked. The door opens. The jailer comes in and gets saved. And he says these words, what must I do? What do you want me to do? Same words. God is preparing people around you. And right now, especially at the moments, you know, the moments we think are most difficult, those are the best moments. You know, think about it. If, if we're going toward a target, it's the moment you're going further away on the bow. You're going further away. Man, I, I'm going the wrong direction. Things, that person's heart seems harder. It's Paul the Apostle, you know, Paul pre the Apostle. It's Saul breathing out threatenings on the road to, to uh, Damascus. Uh, and all of a sudden, he's moments away from getting converted. You're just about to see that person's life be open and 
boom. Suddenly the thrust of God's anointing comes to a prepared audience. I'm going to tell you a story that I've shared before, but it's just, again, this week, uh, middle of a fast here in preparation for the October 25th conference and just germinating, just significant things happening in my heart. And I think about Robert Germain Thomas. I want you to remember that name, Robert Germain Thomas. Uh, He was a young man in Wales uh, in the mid-19th century, had a burden for China. Uh, got married uh, just a few weeks after he got married. He and his wife left on a boat, a four-month journey to go to Wales. I'll go from Wales, rather, to China. Four months. Gets there within a short time, a year or so, couldn't distribute the Bibles in China. Had brought thousands of Bibles with him in Chinese. Uh, and his wife then uh, has a miscarriage. The baby dies. Uh, and then she dies as well. Here he is, 25 years old. He's lost a wife and a baby, the other side of the world, with Bibles. Uh, Here was his statement about his wife. He wrote a letter home. My dear wife sweetly fell asleep in Jesus at 1 o'clock in the morning. She was quite conscious at last, and her last words were, Jesus is very precious to me. Heartbreaking. This guy is still, though, in pursuit. Couldn't do it in China, so he gets a boat to Korea. And the Koreans could understand the characters, so the Bibles will work in Korea. He gets there, and and things just start going south, but he distributes thousands of Bibles uh, before they cut off his head, and he is martyred. That's it. Some people get the Bibles. One of them, a government official, took the Bibles and actually wallpapered a room in his house with the pages of that Bible. Ironically, that room would become a church about 25 years later. People would come read that and be in that church worshiping. So it seemed like nothing good happened. The guy's dead. Well, uh, here is a a quote from a man named Samuel U. Moffat of Princeton Seminary. He said this, a man with such a dramatic martyrdom and intense commitment, which led to that martyrdom, is worthy of becoming a legend. Though he's not known in our nation among the Korean church, uh, Robert Germain Thomas is a household name. He was the guy who came to Korea. He was the man who came. Now what happens? It took 25 years before the first converts started coming. But once they came, then all of a sudden thousands began to get saved. But that still wasn't the major breakthrough. It would be 1906, two years after the Welsh Revival started, a guy from New York came who had heard about the Welsh Revival, and he came there sharing about it. The leaders in 1906 in Korea were stirred to then pray and seek God. They did that throughout the winter, and then in January of 1907, they had a fate-filled meeting uh, in which fresh tears of repentance uh, followed a message about unity in the body. It was a prepared audience. Uh, At that point then, God fell in the room. A church leader confessed that he had been stealing funds from the church. Uh, Another uh, policeman confessed that he had come to spy out the church meeting. A woman confessed adultery toward her husband, and he forgave her openly with tears. A Korean, uh, an old man then, uh, confessed uh, that he had killed He had killed Robert Germain Thomas. The guy who killed him was in the room. At that point, the roof is being lifted off the room. Another elder in the room uh, confesses hatred toward another leader in that city who's in that room. And and all of a sudden, uh, a cry went up. Have you ever seen a picture of the Korean church that when they worship, they worship loudly with their hands up? There is a cry, and it started in that room on that night. It went throughout the city. And and it is said that that cry went out in the city until the lost were dismayed. What is that cry? Why are they yelling? Uh, Because a move of God had taken place in that city. And so uh, from that moment, the Korean revival began. Korea is probably the most Christianized nation in the world. It started with a man giving his life, losing his wife, losing his child, being a martyr, not seeing any fruit, and then it, and then it continued. And this is the prophetic sentence. I love those of you who pray to pray for this. I don't know all the details of what needs to be repented of in our city, but I know something needs to be repented of somewhere, right? Myself included. So I know there's going to be meetings like I described with leaders hugging necks, washing feet, asking forgiveness. And that's going to break things open in our city. I don't expect a move of God without that. 
I'm not going to try and make that happen. God does not need me to do anything. I'm not creative. I'm obedient. I'm just trying to obey him. But I, will, I want to be in that room, and I'm happy to be a person repenting if that's what will help. But that, I believe, is going to fuel the move of God in our region as well. Now, in the book of Nehemiah, when they were building the wall, and I've spent a lot of time these last few months just reading Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra building the temple. Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of the city. Just germinating it over and over again, reading it. over. Let it just go in my heart. Okay, a captive people are called to rebuild. A captive people are called to be revived themselves, that the lost may be awakened. What can we do, Lord, to be revived in us? And this is a great quote that is appropriate for today. Nehemiah 4.14. This is Nehemiah looking out there and challenging the people. I looked and arose and stood and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. At that point, they were being attacked, as we all are, all the time, in your mind particularly, to remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. We're going to go outside in a few moments and we're going to write down the names of people we love that we care about and we're going to put them on that fence. I'm going to tell you some stories to encourage you. Right now there's a 19-year-old man upstairs whose grandma goes to the rock and put his name on the fence a couple of years ago. Uh, he acknowledged this week and told me I could to share this with you uh, that he was not in a great place two years ago. He was not in pursuit of the Lord with all of his heart. Uh, but now he's up, upstairs and he said, I am full, wholeheartedly, passionately serving the Lord. Joey Wilkerson, give God a hand for Joey. He's upstairs. A name on a fence by a grandma. Um, last night, uh, Friday night, I attended the Alternative Pregnancy Banquet, sat with a bunch of folks at our table there, and uh, uh, David King shared the miracle of putting his dad's on, name on the fence a few years ago. His dad, 93 years old, this Christmas came back to the Lord, having been off in weird doctrine, weird understanding, and at 93 was able to come to his senses and give his heart back to God. Then Kathy, David's wife, spoke up and said, my sister, uh, who was involved in a lesbian relationship for 16 years, repented, gave her heart to Jesus, was baptized, cut the whole thing off, and is in pursuit of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Again, her name on the fence. My question is, some Someone was praying for him. Someone was praying for her. Someone was praying for you. Again, I know my mom was praying for me because I got saved on Mother's Day. So uh, it didn't hard to connect those dots. It made it really simple. But who prayed for you? How many of you know someone who was praying for you before you received the Lord? You know someone. Some of you may not know. Maybe it was just someone out there praying. Uh, but I would say, uh, how many of you have people on your heart that you want to know the Lord, that you are crying out for? And, and I would say this. If you don't know of anyone that you have a great burden for to come to know the Lord, then you are that person. <laughs> because it is impossible once you receive what Jesus has done, once you've been rescued from life and death, to not have a burden for those around you to be rescued. So you need to be born again. I love you. But when you're born again, you will have a burden for those around you. Someone prayed for each of us. Uh, I did an interview on K, uh, The Fish this week, and uh, I talked to someone there who had interviewed the young boy from the movie Heaven is Real, who at four years of age went to heaven, uh, and uh, she interviewed him when he was 14. But uh, she was saying that he said when he was very young um, that when his parents, after that visitation, would take him to a funeral that he would walk up to the grieving members of the family and say, did your loved one know Jesus? And if they said no, then he would say to them, then you will not see him in heaven. And so the parents had to stop taking him to funerals <laughs> because he kept just blowing out grieving relatives. Now, it wasn't like the parents told him to say that. He had been to heaven. And he knew that was true. We don't spend a lot of time talking about hell here at all. We talk about heaven a lot. I focus on heaven. But hell's a real deal. I think about hell. Hell inspires me. <laughs> heaven inspires me more, but hell inspires me. When stupid is wanting to come on my life, I think hell. <laughs> 
I don't want to do that. Heaven and hell are both mentioned in the Gospels. Jesus mentions heaven more than hell, but he discusses hell more than heaven. Here's a picture of all the times Jesus spoke about heaven and hell. Last night I was with a young lady who was just sobbing after we went outside, and I didn't know why, and she said something about a relative that she thought was in hell, and I stopped her, and I said, you know what, sweetheart, I would say, because of my anger toward my father who died. I had wounds with him. I would say, as a brand new Christian, my father went to hell. And after a couple of years, the, the Holy Spirit said, he stopped me at that moment and said, you have no right to say where your father is. The most fair person who ever lived, we will stand before. A God who is love. And so I don't know what happens. All I know is some people go to heaven and some people go to hell. The rest is none of my business. But I know some people are going to hell. And I don't want them to be people I love and care about. There's a young girl in the room right now. I'm just looking out and I can see her. I was talking to her last week at the time of talking about connecting. And I mentioned to her, I see you talking for a while. She and her husband, they're 21 and newly married a couple years. And I said, um, you know, do, do your other, she mentioned two sisters. I said, do your sisters know the Lord? And, and she said, no. But I saw just tears welling up in her eyes. And I said, that breaks your heart, doesn't it? And then tears began to come down. And I realized, a prepared audience. Prepared audience. Who is God preparing? Who have you stopped believing they could get saved? And they need you to once again believe. Today, they need you to believe. Paul Rundus was here last night, and as, as we went out, he said, I had a cousin who was dying of AIDS and was far away from God. But two weeks before he died, my brother got to go and lead him to Jesus before he passed away. What opportunities are around us? I see David and Kathy King here just now. Notice them. They were with me Friday night and shared about that. Here's the final verse. I'm going to pass the buckets. Why don't you start passing the buckets right now? Try and multitask if you would. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you're a woman, you can do it naturally. Men, just look at women. Watch what they do. Try and learn. 2 Corinthians 4. If the good news, just focus on this. Focus, focus. The good news we preach is hidden behind a veil. It is hidden only from people who are perishing. Everyone say perishing. Everyone say perishing. It's not a fun word, but it's a real word. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of God. Uh, I want us to pray. Um, and begin to write down uh, the names. You can take you know, one or two of these and then, then pass the buckets around. And um, you got to be careful, guys. Make sure, peel it a little bit right now. If you see any writing on the back, that's the back. The whiter side is the, uh, is the part you're going to stick with, okay? You're going to write on, and then that's the part that will stick. But in case there's doubt, just begin to peel it a little bit and... Um, Begin to write down the names of those you love. And again, once again, if you can't think of anybody, just write your name down. <laughs> You'll be a perfect person to write. Okay, thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege, Lord, of remembering those you love, remembering those you created, those you love with an everlasting love, those you love before the foundation of the world. Lord, you desire that no one would perish your word says, but all would come to repentance. We write their name down in faith, believing, and hoping. In Jesus' name, would you write them down, please?